What's good, everybody? Welcome to the Go Figure Show, episode 25, guys. Welcome. Hope you're having a fantastic week. And hopefully you were watching the news and you were seeing the ups and downs of the uh, capitalism market and everything going on. And that's what today's episode is going to be touching on and digging deep into the Silicon Valley Bank uh, failure, why it happened, what happened, was it a bailout, was it a backstop, was it good, was it bad, and for most things in life, everybody wants to take these crazy positions one way or another. Usually the truth, I find, is somewhere in the middle, Ty, what do you think? Typically, yeah. Yeah. So here's what we're going to check out about this Silicon Valley Bank closure, right? We're going to talk about what really happened with Silicon Valley Bank, why exactly did it fail, right? Now, I've been uh, researching, listening to a lot of podcasts on this, digging deep, to try and translate it, make it simple, because at the end of the day, there are a few things that are complex, but it can be simplified. And that's really what anything in life's about. If you can take your business and what you do in terms of solutions and show how you solve a, a simple problem, then that's what people can understand. Exactly. And I think it's important to understand that you you can lose money with treasury bonds. And that's the next topic that we're going to discuss. And what? I can lose money with treasury bonds? How can this be? I know. I thought that was guaranteed. But, uh, you know, we're going to talk about what the hell is mark to market. Yeah, mark to market and how, who, who thought, who, I didn't, who even knew you could lose money with a bond? Bonds are supposed to be safe. You get old and it's like, oh, look at your investment objectives. You hear all those little financial planner commercials and it's like, well, if you're at retirement age, you should have more of your money in bonds and be more conservative. And so we're going to talk about how that can make sense and in what ways that does not make sense, especially if you're a big bank like Silicon Valley Bank. We're going to talk about what did the government do? Was it a bailout or a backstop? There's going to be all sorts of political backlash and argumentation over the next few weeks about what really happened and did the government do the right thing? Absolutely. And then uh, from there, you know, what would have happened if all the depositors at Silicon Valley Bank had not been made whole? Like what would have happened if there was not a bailout? And that's Crazy to think about. Was it? I mean, is it another 07, 08? You, who knows? I mean, if you had all your money in that bank and, and you're a business owner and you're trying to make payroll this week, you are pretty damn concerned over the weekend about what was going to happen if you were going to have to lay off. I mean, one of our partners, in fact, in that exact position where they were wondering, because their funds, a lot of them were in Silicon Valley Bank, and yeah. they're wondering, oh, shit, are we going to have to, like, lay everybody off because – this crazy bank failure happened, which is is pretty rare when banks uh, fail. We saw a lot of that in 08, 09. And uh, bank failures, there's part of it that's uh, insured by the government. But, but if you're a business and you've got some employees and you hold money for payroll, like your bank fails and it puts you in a real massive bind. And so we're going to take a look at, well, what banks are actually still at risk and uh, one of our big local banks here in the Mountain West, Utah area is one of those, uh, which is surprising. So we'll take a look at, well, what are those banks that are actually still at risk and uh, what's going to happen with them? Yeah. And then from there to, to kind of bring it all together, we need to talk about how this is actually going to impact us, how it's going to yeah. impact mortgage rates, how it's going to impact potential inflation, right? There's a, 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 a ripple effect that, that could definitely occur from this whole situation with the banks. So it's a fun episode. It is, it is, and it's one of those that's fresh, it's relevant, and a lot of people are saying a lot of different things, and what we want to do is really just take an objective view. I always come back to, uh, you know, and, and I talk a lot about how college might not be a very good investment for most people, but I did learn one great thing from one of my honors professors, uh, Catherine Lindquist, in a class I took in 19, 1999, it was the spring semester of 1999, and so she was teaching this class and she was teaching it about like the history of the world. And she had like, you know, the uh, Old Testament, we we're studying that. And it was the history of the Jew Jewish people in the Old Testament. And then we had the New Testament, which was, you know, the, the different, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and the reason I bring that up is if you're of a Judeo-Christian background, oftentimes we, we put those together and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, it's the same thing. And so she made us step back and say, no, it's actually a little bit different if you have this perspective and you try to look at it through different eyes objectively and look at every you know, side of an argument of an issue. And that was one of the best things that uh, one of the few things I did learn in college, that if you look at issues honestly, objectively, both sides of a story, 
you're going to find the honesty and the truth somewhere in the middle. So that's where what we like to do here is tackle these issues objectively, not from a political standpoint, not from any you know bias standpoint, but doing our best to try and keep it real and tell you you know what the real truth is of the matter. So that's it. What really happened with Silicon Valley Bank? Why did it fail? There's a lot of different articles about this. So here's one uh, that we took uh, from Forbes. Uh, Jillian, if you want to share this uh, one here, it's uh, the first link there. What to know about Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, the biggest bank failure since 2008. 2008 2009, there were a lot of bank failures because of risky mortgage-backed securities. So basically, you know, people bought a lot of homes with mortgages that they didn't verify income for. And if you get a mortgage and you actually don't make any money, well, shit, you might not pay that back. And so they took all that and Wall Street sold it to investors. And in 2008 and 9, they figured out, well, damn, all these mortgage-backed securities, these financial, these loans that I'm going to get paid a return on, actually I'm not because so many people defaulted because they didn't actually qualify for them. They didn't have any money. They didn't put any down payments down. So the investors were left holding the bag. And a lot of these banks lent risky money, et cetera, et cetera. And so then they had the Dodd-Frank Act. Oh, we're not going to let this happen again. And so how did this happen again? Well, let's take a look. So Silicon Valley Bank collapsed in spectacular fashion Friday, just days after it announced big losses, creating the biggest bank failure in the United States since the Great Recession and quickly sparking a government plan to protect depositors. So what's interesting about this, a week or two earlier, they were actually, this bank, Silicon Valley Bank, was getting awards in London. And so the CEO was like in London like two weeks ago. Uh, I found out uh, about uh, nine to 10 months ago, their chief risk officer, when you're like a bank, you need somebody looking at your risk and where are you putting your money as a bank? Because basically all these depositors, I open a bank account, you open a bank account, and all that money's there and the bank doesn't make any money unless they lend it out. Yep or if they do something with it. So they were lending it out. They were doing mortgages, car loans, mostly for tech owners and tech employees. Uh, because you found out something interesting, right, Ty? Like what percent of Silicon Valley bank accounts are held by like tech companies? Or yeah, what percentage well, what of tech they companies said is bank there? Slightly over 50% of VC-backed tech organizations or tech companies are actually with SVB, they, they have vast majority of their funds with them, which obviously tech has taken a huge hit, not to mention what percentage of these VC backed startups actually are even profitable or making any money at this point, which from our experience, a lot of them don't make money for quite some time. So I, I mean, it kind of makes perfect sense to me why SVP is failing, but so it's fascinating, right? In 2020 and 2021, everybody was home. And so a lot of software companies and social media companies and tech-based companies, your Amazons, your Netflix, your Facebook, all, all these different companies, tech companies did really well because people were home. They just, hey, I'm going to buy this yep. stuff. I'm going to invest in technology. I'm going to get stuff because I'm just sitting at home. And then 2022, things started to change. And basically what happened is the market's like, well, wait a second, uh, these tech companies are all losing money. And so you saw companies like Netflix, their stock went down 70%. Yeah. You know, Facebook stock went down 40%. Apple stock, even Apple stock was was nosediving. It's so all these tech companies were doing poor in 2022. And so what that meant is all these VC firms, all these, these venture capital firms gave these tech companies, these startups money, and they deposited it all in 2020 and 2021. And then they didn't actually make as much profits. And so then they were spending all that money and all that money was sitting there in Silicon Valley Bank being spent. So the bank account balances went up and then they started to go down. And so if you're Silicon Valley Bank, you're going to lend the money out, which they did. But then they did some other things with it, which seemed to be safe, but actually ended up not being safe. So here's what it says. It says the closure capped a few tumultuous days for SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. A lender to technology startups, apparently more than half of tech startups that get venture capital money, they all bank at Silicon Valley Bank, right? It's uh, you said birds of a feather flock together and Silicon Valley Bank, hey, if you are a tech company and you got venture capital money, come park it here. We got you and we'll give you special hookups, special loans for mortgages, car loans. And they were even giving loans, 
high risk loans to some of these startups that were losing a lot of money. So maybe not such a good idea. I mean, we want these startups to get money and have a chance to succeed. But if they are, you know, if you're using bank deposit money, that's basically what you are. If you're a bank, you have all these bank deposits. You know, you put like 100000 in the bank. Well, I need to lend that out. So I might lend it out in a mortgage, a car loan. But if I lend it out in a high-risk business loan to a company that's losing money, that's a tough one. That one might not be a good idea. So anyway, it said they announced on Wednesday, this is just last week, like this happened so fast, that they had sold $21 billion in securities at a loss. So this is what we were talking about, right? They bought these treasury bonds and, and mortgage-backed securities that were, and by the way, these are mortgage-backed securities that weren't seeing defaults, like that people were paying their bills. So it wasn't like this really horrible outlandish decision, but what they did was they locked the money up in 10-year bonds. And if you're a bank and you kind of need to have liquidity, so what happened is all these bank uh, venture capital-backed companies, they're spending all their money. And they were supposed to slow it down. I was uh, watching a podcast. You've probably seen a guy named David Sachs who's been making the rounds on CNBC, Fox News, CNN, all these different uh, uh, places. He owns his own venture capital firm. He's one of the PayPal mafia. He was the COO at PayPal with Elon Musk. Very smart, incredibly successful tech investor, smart guy, very objective. And he was telling his all the companies he invested in last year, hey, guys, Time to slow down the spend, time to be profitable, time to really focus in and make sure we're not, we're only investing money that makes us money and makes profits in the business. And a lot of them didn't listen to them. So those bank balances are going down. And then meanwhile, Silicon Valley Bank's like, oh, we've got $100 billion in deposits. We don't have enough mortgages to lend out. So we're going to buy some of these 10-year bonds. And while that seemed to be a good idea, what happened is interest rates went up. And so... They were actually upside down in these bonds. Like they were down like significantly, apparently. And so then it said, let's see. So so they sold $21 billion in securities at a loss of $1.8 billion. So they had to sell these because they needed to, for the, the requirements as a bank, you have to have enough money on hand, right? Yeah. If you don't have enough money on hand, you get shut down. And that's literally updated every single day. Like the government does have good regulation in terms of banks having to prove where they're out on a daily basis. And so their cash levels were coming down because deposits were going down. So they had to sell these securities at a loss to get more cash. And as they did that, now they've got a $1.8 billion loss. And so they're like, oh, we're, we're going to raise $2.35 billion in capital. And so it, it tried to sell stock and it came at it from a very arrogant perspective, right? Instead of being honest, like, actually, we're in a shitload of trouble. It was, we're a badass Silicon Valley bank. Everything's fine. Here's some shares, investors. Why don't you buy some shares? And what happened was Moody's that rates everybody as a company, as a bank. They're like, actually, we're going to you know, downgrade you from an A rating to like a C or a D rating. And they're like, wait, what? And then word got out about that. Investors like, hell no, we're not buying more. By the way, they were trading at $700, they were already down to $300, you know, a week or two ago. And now, of course, it's zero. So in the last year, they had lost more than half of their value because the writing was on the wall. Deposits were going down and they put all this money in, you know, these treasury bonds that were going down. So now it says shares of parent company SVB Financial were halted Friday morning after falling 64% in one day, following another 60% dive on Thursday amid concerns of the bank's stability and CEO Greg Becker told the bank's clients to stay calm, but they didn't. They all took their money out, and so it's an old-fashioned bank run. Back in 1929, when there was like a depression, you know, banks were failing, and people were literally losing all their money. This was, this was actually before they had like FDIC insurance. I think President uh, FDR Franklin Delano Roosevelt came out with FDIC insurance, where if a bank fails, you at least have a certain amount of money that are backed up. So in this case, there was $250,000 in FDIC insurance per bank account, but like a massive amount of the money there was actually not insured. It was way beyond $250,000. If you're a big company with 100 employees, 50 employees, like that's nothing. That's one, one payroll, and all of a sudden that, that money's gone. So, wow. So that's a lot of shit that just went down. Let's kind of take our breath here and uh, break this down. So, so what are your thoughts in hearing about how – Silicon Valley Bank and failed and, and why it failed. 
I I mean, I think it comes down to they weren't diversified, right? You, oh, yeah. you look at it like this, things are going really well. You're getting constant deposits. Cash flow is great. <laughs> let's buy these bonds. And then all of a sudden, big tech gets absolutely obliterated. Everybody that's been making all this money, all these businesses, all these individuals that you're banking on depositing are now losing jobs, <laughs> losing money. They don't have the cash to bring in to, uh, to infuse your bank. I think... You know, that's exactly what happened. And what's crazy, too, is not just did they, uh, like, I, I think it was the CEO that sold off a bunch of his he shares. He sure did. That Friday. You're damn not right only that, but yeah. they also gave all managers, like, a massive bonus that, that morning Friday. as well. I, <laughs> I'm kind of thinking that we're about to see a lot of fraud that's going to be unveiled. I, I don't know. That's just my take. I'm I'm smelling something a little little fishy here but I, I think you're right and and one of our mentors pbd has said that 2023 is going to be the year of the investigation right so you know you got investigations happening about well where did covid really come from and by the way youtube don't get mad i'm just asking the question where did it really come from that's a question you know what uh, kind of work was our government doing what did fauci say was it right wrong um, what about all these, uh, you know, companies that took money? There was PPP loan fraud. You've got uh, other frauds with all these government programs, and it's into the billions and billions of dollars. You've got charities that were supposed to be taking charities to help people or to help, like, different causes, like, uh, you know, um, I won't mention them, but they they were buying houses with the money, right? They were doing crazy stuff. So you've got all these different people that took advantage of the last three years of the easy money, and now they're, it's going to, going to come to roost. I think it's a great point you bring up. Silicon Valley Bank failed because they, you know, in business, we always say start out with a niche. So their niche was, hey, we're all, we are tech companies. We are the banker for tech companies. And they went all in with that. And then at some point, you need to go into different verticals when you get big, but they never did. No. Right. They never went into the vertical of, hey, we're going to deal with, you know, uh, plumbers and, and retail stores and regular business owners that are a little bit less risky than a tech startup. And we love tech startups. I mean, we're in some ways a fintech startup ourselves, but we are a profitable business and, and have worked hard to get to that position. But a lot of tech companies are not. So you've got high risk there where they might have a million dollars in that bank account. And by the end of the year, if they run out of money, they're gone and they're gone as a client. And then if you gave them loans, well, they, are they going to pay them back? They're going to struggle to pay them back, right? And so if you don't go after a more conservative base of business owner of clients, then you're right. You're not diversified. And then, and then if the majority of your capital goes into long-term treasury bonds. And if you need money, like where was the, I don't understand how that could make sense. If you, so here's what I didn't understand. And maybe you would hope they understand this, but if you're a bank and, and you lock up your money in a treasury bond, but the value goes down in the in between and you have to sell it, then you're going to lose money. And I think that's where a lot of people didn't know that, but they, they should have known that. Yeah. So that kind of leads us into our next uh, article here. So how do you lose money specifically with treasury bonds and WT, HRF, whatever you want to say, it, what is mark to market and how does this work? That is a great question. So here we go. So this is an article from Bloomberg. Uh, Jillian, if you want to share this one with the audience. So this is SVB's 44-hour collapse was rooted in treasury bets during pandemic. So let's unpack this. So Greg Becker, the CEO, sat in a red armchair at an invite-only conference in Los Angeles last week. Uh, we pri And he said, we pride ourselves on being the best financial partner in the most challenging times. And uh, that's what he was telling. And then uh, he was at the Bank of the Year Honors at a London Gala. Oops, I guess that wasn't a good award to be given them. Uh, a week later, it all fell about apart. SVB's collapse into federal deposit insurance receivership came suddenly. Let's see if we can get... All right, U.S. venture capital-backed companies raised $330 billion in 2021. A lot of them put that money in. And then, of course, they've spent that money over the last year. SBB took in tens of billions of dollars from its venture capital clients and then, confident that rate, rates would stay steady, plowed that cash into longer-term bonds. In doing so, it created and walked straight into a trap. Becker and other leaders of the Santa Clara-based institution, 
Let's see. It's the biggest bank failure since Washington Mutual back in 2008. And everybody was back to doing mortgages like I was with WAMU. WAMU was a big mortgage-backed uh, company, and they did give out some uh, high-risk loans, and they sadly were the bi- biggest bank failure. They went from like $300 billion to like $2 billion. And so this one is just a little bit uh, smaller than that. And they were trying to lock up $2 billion in capital. They couldn't do it. And then investors and depositors tried to pull $42 billion on Thursday. And so they had they had violated the cash requirements to have money out. And basically, that's when the government stepped in. So, so here's what's, what's interesting. So it says the bank's total deposits exploded higher over the prior 12 months to about $124 billion from $62 billion. And so that was a big increase. But then basically they took that money. So, so let's let's break this down. So they had all this money. They lent out some of it to tech founders so they could buy houses. Probably okay. They're making good money a lot. Probably hopefully they made good decisions on that. But they've got collateral, right? It's lower yeah. risk. They've got the properties collateral. They gave them car loans. They got collateral. And then they gave out some business loans. Hopefully they made good decisions there. Um, I don't think anybody knows. I'm guessing that there's been some defaults there. There's a lot of tech companies that struggled the last 18 months. So I'm guessing they had defaults there. So they had some pressure, but the majority thing that took them down, if what we're hearing is accurate, is they had all this money and they didn't have anywhere to put it. So they're like, oh, we'll put it in treasury bonds. But instead of doing maybe shorter term bonds, they did a 10-year bond. So if they put $100 million in it, and I think it's maybe $80 billion that they put into it, $85 billion, something like that. If you put it into a 10-year, you make 2% a year, let's call it, and at the end of 10 years, you know, $100 billion becomes $120. But if you have to sell it in one to two years, which is what they ended up having to do because all these tech companies were draining their bank accounts because they weren't making money, they were just spending it. Well, if that happens, then they have to sell those bonds. And now, because rates have gone from, you know, 1% or 2% up to almost 4.75% with the Fed rate, there's a big gap there. And so now, nobody wants to buy your 10-year bond that you bought at 2%. They're buying the 10-year bond at 5%, right? And so that's what's happened. And so now that 10-year bond is actually not worth $100 billion, It's worth $85 million. And so they have a $15 billion loss there. But the government regulators actually didn't make them count it because they hadn't sold it, right? The old idea where, hey, if I don't sell the stock, I haven't lost it yet. And if you're patient, time will generally help you win as long as you made a good decision. But if you can't be patient here and you have to sell it early, then you take this massive loss. And so that's how you can lose money with treasury bonds. Who would have thought? Yeah, it's re- it's really interesting. And as you're talking more and more about this, it's starting to make more and more sense to me, Leo. It's starting, it, it, it almost feels so simple. Like when you look at these VC backed companies, like we, we've talked to some of them recently, VCs tell you, you have to spend that money. If we're going to give you that money, yeah, it's got to be spent. Right. And that's where you see, like, even right in our backyard, some of these big VC backed groups, like Christmas time hits and it's like, well, shit, we have all this money. You get, Peloton, you get a Peloton, you get a Peloton, you get a smoker. Let's spend the money, get it's it out like of here. It's like Oprah, everybody gets it. And it's bum. like, no shit. All these companies, big tech is booming. They're getting all these funds from VCs. They deposit those funds. They're required to spend all this money. The business isn't doing well, so the money's not being replenished. Seems Gone. so simple. Gone. I mean, I just remember, you know, before we started Seven Figures and we're at a previous company, and we're, we're leasing out this space. And this big tech company um, that had been valued at like a billion dollars, they had leased out the entire building. And then they had just laid off like three or 400 people. So they're bleeding money with this big building where they only need a third of the size of it. And, and then they had paid like $2,500 a desk. And these were like you know, retro like metal in a wood, dungeon. like dungeon <laughs> desk, but they spent like twenty five hundred dollars per like yeah. desk, not counting all the computers and stuff you have to buy. Like instead of going and getting a, a decent desk for one hundred, two hundred bucks at IKEA, which is what we do, you know, they spent a fortune on these really nice desks, and and so that's just what they do. They bleed money, but it's one thing to invest into something that's going to make you money. And it's quite another to just blow it on stuff that doesn't make you money. And that's what most small business owners do wrong, right? 
you start a business, you're trying to grow it, and you're focused on investing it in all the wrong areas. Oh, I need, you know, to have a really nice office space. No, you don't. You need to make some money. You need to make some sales. And I always share this example because I love it. I love the example of the the beer brewer. What's the, the company's name there? Sam Adams. Well, Sam, Samuel Adams. Yeah. I love that story because that guy starts this beer company. He's worried about spending his money on all the wrong things. His uncle invested 80 grand in him, a Wall Street guy, and he calls him up and he's like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting cabinets and file folders and all this stuff. And he's like, no, stop. Go knock on some doors and get some sales. It's sales, stupid. Like every small business, every startup, you need sales. And if your product sucks, well, you're not going to get very many sales. So make a great product and then work on every value proposition to show your client you solve their problem, you know their problem, you understand them, and then focus on getting that marketing and sales to distribute that product out. If you have a good product, if it has issues, listen to your clients, make the improvements constantly, and that's how you win in business. But every tech company that starts a business or small business owner that focuses on all the wrong things and spends money on stuff that doesn't make them money, that doesn't generate sales, is bound to fail. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think that Yes, the government came in and I, I would call it a bailout, but I think they're going to use this as a precedence. Like, I think they're going to use this to set a precedence. And I think what's going to come out from all of this is there's going to be way more regulation that goes into VCs, that goes into okay. startups and, and receiving the funding. And like I said, diversifying your portfolio as a bank. Like some of them that work, USAA, the they work solely with veterans. That's because, well, they they come home or, or they get out of the military and they do numerous different things. They're not all tied into one singular industry. There are some that are out there for teachers. Well, teachers is a very, very safe government position. So it, it makes sense. But when you have a bank that's solely supported by one single industry that can go away like that, like I, I think there's going to be a lot more regulation coming because of this. No question. All right, so that takes us to our third topic here. What did the government do? Was it a bailout or a backstop? What's the difference? All right, well, here's an article from our good friends at Bloomberg, and it says, says why the U.S. backstop after SVB's failure is actually a bailout. So it says, in the end, all of Silicon Valley Bank's depositors were protected. So all of those companies, and I think it was 91% or 85%, like the vast majority of those deposits, I think they had $175 billion in deposits, um, 150, 160, I think 150 of it was uninsured. So the majority was in accounts that were way bigger than 250000 They were in the millions, tens of millions. And so most of that money was not insured. And if the government had not stepped in, those depositors would not have gotten their money back. And we're going to break that down Which, in kind of our next segment. Thank here. goodness they yeah. did. Like those of you that are really pissed off about the bailout, like think about it like you just talked about, Leo, from a different perspective. You're uh, Everyone's saying, oh, well, they get what they deserve, blah, blah, blah. Well, look at it like this. Hospitals utilize a lot of the tech that would have been going out of business, right? A lot of companies like us who are doing just fine that aren't banking with them, well, guess what? Maybe our payroll company was one of those big tech groups that is now shut down because of SVBs um, going under, right? There, there's, it, the ripple effect is massive here, Leo. It doesn't just impact, impact tech. It impacts every single business out there because whether you realize it or not, you're probably using one of these companies that's actually going to go down if SVB isn't bailed out? No question. And right now you're going to see a lot of political response here where there's going to be different sides that are, you know, super disappointed and they feel like, why are we bailing out, you know, big tech and this, that, and the other. And they're going to look back and it's interesting. And 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 I'll talk about this because I, I lived through it and a lot of us did in that 08, 09 recession. When that happened, you had some really big banks that because they had made these risky mortgages legitimately could go out of business. And if they did, and and there were a lot of people saying, oh, let the big banks fail, screw the big banks. But you know who you screw when the big banks fail? Oh, I don't know, the millions of you know small mom and pop business accounts, the tens of millions of you know small bank accounts that families have that they use to pay the bills. 
Yes, up to 250000 and back then I think it was 100000 uh, would have been saved, but everything above and beyond that would not have businesses, would not have been able to make payroll, jobs would have been lost, and it legitimately could have taken down the entire financial system. And it was there was massive uh, outrage. I remember in a lot of spots here in Utah, like there were a lot of people, oh, this was the worst thing ever. And you're just lying to yourself. If you think that if the big banks go out of business, there's not going to be any negative impact on you. It will impact every aspect of your life, all of the businesses you do business with, all of the regular, even grocery stores you buy things from. All of those people, businesses, and jobs would have been put at risk if they had not backstopped that. And they they did bail out these big banks. But you know what was amazing? Uh, these big banks and insurance companies, they did pay it all back with interest. So the taxpayer was made whole. It wasn't like some of the government spending where the government spending spends and there's nothing that comes back. Like it was all pay, paid back. So in this case, Silicon Valley Bank is not being officially bailed out because all of the owners, the uh, executives, their stock is worthless. It's gone to zero. The only people being bailed out are all of the businesses and people that had bank accounts there above $250,000. They're being bailed out, but they didn't do anything wrong. They opened a bank account, right? And if you've got, you know, $5 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but you got a hundred employees, that's not a lot of money. Yeah. You might barely be making profits and you're not going to make payroll. And if uh, it's $5 million in that account, 250 of it's insured, well, the other, you know, $4.75 million is not insured. And so you're going to have to let everybody go. Everybody suffers. And you didn't do anything wrong. The bank did. The executives did up top. And so for the depositors to be bailed out, yeah, if you were a depositor, you'd want to be bailed out. And it would have affected everything. We were t- say, talking about half of the tech companies in the country had their banking there. Yeah. It would have affected everybody. There would have been massive job losses. There would have been systemic risk that it really could have. And then what happens is at the end of the day, and this is what I learned in 08, 09, the banking system, capitalism, and every country's financial system is actually backed by one thing, confidence. It's backed by confidence in the people in the system because no bank has 100% cash available for every deposit. They're lending out their most of them making very conservative decisions. The top-ranked bank in, t- in terms of safety and security is Chase. There's a reason why we bank at Chase, because of that. And so, but even Chase, if everybody went to remove all their money at once, they're probably not going to have enough cash to do that. And that's how bank runs happen. And that's why confidence in the system is vital to keep the system moving forward. As long as there is confidence, it will be fine And if there's not confidence, then things will not be fine. And it's still capitalism is the number one most effective system that gives everybody a chance. I mean, we talk with, you know, immigrants every day that come to America, that start a business, that live the American dream, that came from nothing. You can't do that in anywhere in any other part of the world. And it's because this is the best system that's ever been invented. Now, hey, maybe someday someone will invent one better. But it sure as hell is not socialism. It's definitely not communism. Capitalism is the number one system. And when these things happen, if you don't back up the people, then the confidence in the system is lost. Exactly. Like if this if this bailout didn't occur, it goes all the way as far as like there's a lot of small grocery stores whose credit card processors are dependent on a big tech company that was with SVB. And if you're a grocery store and all of a sudden you can't accept a credit or debit card, like you're out of business. You, you can't go very long. And it and it takes time to get that set up with another group. And so all of a sudden, grocery stores are out of business. Gas stations are out of business. It, it would have impacted way, way, way more businesses than just those that are part of SVB. And people just aren't looking at it like that. But no, I, I agree with everything you just said there, Leo. I think it is still by far the best country the best opportunity capitalism is still very strong um i i think that again i'm not predicting another 0708 situation because of this i i kind of think it's it's more so to throw some sanctions down get some regulation and and move on but it'll be interesting to see what happens in the the coming weeks here because apparently there's quite a few more banks and one of them that's right in our backyard that are also kind of struggling here no question, which which is uh, is kind of crazy. Let's look at just a couple of interesting uh, stories here. 
uh, in some articles about this. It says, uh, Stefan uh, Kalb was in the middle of a meeting around 1 p.m. on Thursday when a fellow company executive sent him, sent him a panicked Slack message. Do you know what's happening at Silicon Valley Bank? Called the CEO and co-founder of Seattle-based food management startup, just a food company. Yep. Shelf Engine had been following news of a bank run at Silicon Valley Bank, with droves attempting to pull out $42 billion from the bank on Thursday, a loan on fears that it was teetering on the brink. This happened so fast because Moody was was coming in last Wednesday, and by Friday it was done. Like, man, that was fast. So the bank was on firm financial footing supposedly on Wednesday. The following day, it was underwater. For Shelf Engine, a 40-person startup founded in 2015 that uses artificial intelligence to help grocery stores reduce food waste, this was a major problem. Not only did Silicon Valley Bank help the company process checks and payments, but all of the startup's cash was locked up in the bank. Cobb sprang into action. He and his team quickly opened an account at J.P. Morgan Chase, because that's what all the VC firms were saying, put it there and attempted to wire transfer every last penny out of Silicon Valley Bank. Unfortunately, our wire was not honored, and our money was left at Silicon Valley Bank, Kolb said. In an interview on Friday, we woke up this morning hoping the money would be in that. Can you imagine, like, the anxiety, the panic? Oh, my gosh. It'd just be, he'd just be ill because you're like, oh, my, I've got to, got to lay off 40 people who are not going to be able to pay their bills and take care of their family. And all we did was set up a bank account. We didn't make those bad decisions to deserve what happened, and that's what's crazy. So while he declined to provide the exact amount, he noted that Shell's engine has raised more than $60 million from investors. It was a very large sum of money, he said, of the transfer. It is a nail-biting limbo state that many tech startups deeply entrenched in Silicon Valley Bank are now facing, or were facing, now they all uh, should have their money back uh, for sure by today, if not uh, yesterday. And for tech startups, which for decades have relied heavily on the bank based in Santa Clara, California, has set off a crisis that could lead to mass layoffs, hundreds of startups collapsing, according to industry insiders. If the government doesn't step in, I think a whole generation of startups will be wiped off the planet. And technology is what makes lives better, right? You look at all the technology that's happened in the last few decades, the internet was built by technology companies, social media, all the way we run every aspect of our lives through technology is run through this, this uh, environment. And so it was an existential threat or risk to innovators, to you know competition in America, and really would have been you know, massively damaging. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as a global economy, it, it would have put us so far behind competition like China, right? All of a sudden, 100%. all of these tech businesses are out and we're back at square one. It's it's just devastating to even think about. No question. So that said, what banks are still at risk? We still saw a lot of banks, not to Silicon Valley Bank, but a lot of banks that, uh, you know, their stock prices went down. And oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to mention this. So <laughs> I was watching this video popped up on a podcast I was watching and it's Jim Cramer, the mad money guy, bald guy, high energy, you know, uh, likable guy at CNBC. And this is the same guy that in 08, 09 was telling people where all these places they should put their money into companies that went out of business and to investments that went to zero he still has a show. I don't know. Maybe he's been more right than wrong. <laughs> I, I would hope so. But five weeks ago, apparently he was saying, hey, guys, Silicon Valley Bank is a bye, 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 bye. You know, he has this, all these little uh, um, special effects that he has in his little show. And so he's bye, 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 Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, it didn't turn out very well, Jim. Probably uh, probably feels pretty bad about uh, that recommendation. But anyway, that's what he was saying. Yeah, start taking the opposite. I, I have a question as, as we're diving into this and talking about what other banks are struggling and potentially going under. I I know a little bit about this, and if I'm putting you on the spot, I apologize, but you, you always hear that, oh, join a credit union, and credit unions are safer. And I know the big difference is credit union, like it's a pool of the members' money that they're then going out and, and investing. But how is a how is a credit union really different from a bank, and why is it that we don't see credit unions failing? It's a good question. I don't remember ever saying that a credit union has failed. And I guess I would kind of uh, 
you know, call it the the Amazon or the Costco example, right? Like you've got Amazon that has all these members that are on that prime recurring revenue stream that gives them a lot of extra cash balance and protection from different, you know, things that can happen in their business, ups and downs, cyclical nature of business. And Costco, same thing. I mean, they're collecting 50 to to $100 in annual membership fees, membership fees, and so that extra money is there, and it really is is just a buffer. And so the same thing happens at credit unions, where you're putting up, you know, twenty five or thirty dollars or whatever it is. And so you know, you all of a sudden have a million or two million or three million members of your credit union. You've got an extra fifty to one hundred million dollars in a small credit union in cash just sitting there, in addition to all of the other bank deposits just to be a member. And the only way though that membership money is taken out is that they close the account. And a lot of credit unions are really good at doing a couple different products. They're great at doing auto loans. They're great at doing home equity lines of credit. And so they build great relationships. And auto loans and home equity lines of credit traditionally have low default rates. And so they're just very good at making those conservative decisions. But it is the membership fee alone that I feel like makes them lower risk than a bank because a bank doesn't have membership fees. And so there are different pros and cons with a bank versus a credit union. But at the end of the day, here's, here's what I know. Here's what I know after, you know, being an entrepreneur for over 20 years and, and whatever, like credit unions always seem to have the best rates when it comes to a car loan, a boat loan, a home equity line of credit. Like for some reason, the banks just can't compete with that. And so there's something about that setup within a credit union that makes them a little bit lower risk. And I, I agree. I think it's very rare that you see a credit union go out of business. And there's something to be said about that membership deposit plus regular bank deposits that credit unions get. And credit unions don't ever seem to go into the more exotic stuff. Banks will get into investment banking, right? Well, they're yeah. taking investments or they're taking more risk. Credit unions don't ever seem to do that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's, it's advice that my father gave me a long time ago was I do all my personal stuff at a, a credit union and we do all our business stuff with Chase. And I followed that and it's been like sound advice so far. But it's, it is. I think it's very, have to look very, into that sound, more. very sound advice. Okay, so what regional banks are out there struggling? Okay, so you got Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank that were both closed down. You know what's, you know what's fascinating about Signature Bank? So after 08 and 09 happened, uh, President Obama got with uh, Barney Frank and a guy named Dodd, and, and, and then the Dodd-Frank Act was put together. And this was like financial regulation to make banks safer and make better decisions. One of the things that came out of that was this treasury bond thing where if you're a bank and you buy a bunch of treasury bonds, well, theoretically, 10 years down the road, if you bought a 10-year bond like Silicon Valley Bank did, yeah, you'll get your money back at a profit. You'd be fine. So they called that you know, really low risk. It didn't count against them. But they didn't actually count the true market value, the mark-to-market value from Dodd-Frank. But any, it, it, So this is so fascinating. So, so Barney Frank, who was this outspoken... I want to say he was like a congressman from Massachusetts. He puts this uh, Dodd-Frank Act together, and then, uh, you know, he retires from Congress. And, you know, if you worked in Congress, all of a sudden you get all this free money coming to you after you retire. And so he was put on the board of Signature Bank, which just went out of business as well as Silicon Valley Bank last week. <laughs> so it's just kind of interesting. He was the guy who came up with the Dodd-Frank Act, and then he's on one of the other banks that goes out of business. And Signature Bank um, had a lot of uh, crypto-based uh, firms. That, so, again, another great example you just said. They were not diversified. They're like, oh, we're the crypto bank. It's all these crypto companies and, and crypto technologies were at their bank. And, of course, things have not gone well for them yeah. the last uh, year or so. And so they went out of business last week, too. And a third bank, uh, Silvergate Bank, also did. So we've got three bank failures so far. And I don't know anything about Silvergate, but again, I don't either. You, you look at Signature Bank, like you said, the diversification issue and massive, massive fraud. It seems like it's always coming back yes. to that. Yes, no, no question about it. So other banks, uh, now there's a local bank here uh, in the Utah area, Mountain West, well-known. I think a lot of people really have, feel like it has a great reputation. I think it does have a reputation for helping small businesses out. 
Now we've seen in Silicon Slopes here in Utah, which is a is a tech hub, that there's been a lot of tech companies. I haven't seen a lot going out of business, but I've we've seen a lot of them. Some of the bigger, you know, billion dollar tech companies here really reducing staff, letting a lot of people go. And so I wonder if a lot of them, if they weren't with Silicon Valley Bank, maybe they were with Zions. But it's interesting to see Zion's uh, stock price has, re- I mean, they were down 25%, I think, just uh, over the last two days. Now, I think there's been a bump today, but they, I think they were down 25% yesterday, not counting what they were down the week before that. And they're down uh, well over 50, 60% over the last year. Yeah, that's a good point, especially here in like the Utah County area where tech is very, very, very powerful. And there's a ton of individuals that like you said likely do bank with Zions Bank and either they've been laid off or I have a lot of friends that work in tech that have said like it's just gotten so hard to make money commissions are getting really cut. tough for sales not only getting cut but yeah, yeah just generating leads is getting really really tricky so I bet income I mean a lot of these people were making a lot of money two years ago probably got into homes that all of a sudden they can't afford anymore and they're starting to default yeah. they can't make their auto loan payments and it takes time for a bank to go take a vehicle and, and turn around and they're typically always going to sell it at a little bit of a loss. Like there's, yeah. there's a lot that goes into that, but yeah. And, and so all these different things are happening and yet somehow the jobs report keeps on showing all these positive job increases. I don't get it. And it's interesting. I was watching a podcast uh, with um, uh, Harry Habib or something like that. He's a mortgage rate expert and he's been very accurate in predicting where mortgage uh, interest rates go and uh, he was actually making the case, and I didn't understand all the dynamics of it, but basically he was looking at all these jobs reports and saying, actually, these are like older job reports that they make estimates based on surveys. And so a lot of it, it's almost like a Fugazi, a Fugazi, you know, uh, Wolf of Wall Street in terms of some of those job report numbers that may not be quite as accurate as we think. And so he actually thinks... The jobs are actually not piling up, that really they are stacking up losses and it's just going to be delayed. And so he thinks uh, he's predicting and he's been pretty accurate the last decade that, um, you know, some of these uncertainties will continue to happen. There will be more job losses, more pullback from different companies. And so if that ultimately happens, then that brings us to our final ending topic here, which is how does this affect all of us, right? How is this going to affect mortgage interest rates and car loan interest rates and all types of interest rates that affect our ability to, you know, buy things and to live the kind of life that we want? And so interestingly enough, the Wall Street Journal has an article today called Collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank Calls Fed Interest Rate Path into Question. So that's the thing that's happened, right? Because the Fed has raised interest rates at an unprecedented level and like if you look at the charts like it's been you know around zero to one to two percent and then it was going up a little bit the pandemic we went back to zero in the pandemic and now we've gone from zero to five like that's a lot every quarter step is is a big move when the fed raises or lowers rates a quarter percent over the last 10 15 years that's been looked at as a big move and for the fed to have raised rates from zero to almost five percent like that's really about four steps per percent. So we're talking about, you know, four times five, like 20 major steps. And within a year, it's understandable that people didn't expect that. Some of them, they should have seen a little bit of the writing in the wall when you spend that much government money. But ultimately, what does this mean for Jerome Powell? According to the article, it's saying that um, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates until something breaks. That that was their idea, right? We've got to pull inflation down. By the way, inflation came back a little lower today, down to 6% even. And so a sharp sell-off in regional bank stocks Monday following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank risk, pushing the Fed uncomfortably close to the one place it wanted to avoid, which is resolving a financial stability trauma at the same time it fights high inflation. The situation could force Fed Chair Jerome Powell and his colleagues. And by the way, sometimes Jerome goes by Jay. So <laughs> Jay Powell and Jerome Powell, same guy. And his colleagues into choosing what problem demands the central bank's top focus. We've always said that the one thing that could derail the Fed's tightening or rather increase of interest rates is if there's a financial crisis. It's not clear whether a criteria has uh 
crisis has been averted yet. And so Fed officials slowed their pace of rate rises last month when they hosted the benchmark. But then the job rate keeps coming up higher. Inflation showed that it wasn't coming down, but it did come down um, with today's numbers. And then following the bank failures, investors in interest rate future markets saw a greater than one in three chance that the Fed would hold rates steady, which would be big because I think most people are expecting the Fed to raise rates by 25 to 50 basis points, like a quarter to half of, of one percentage point. And so now they actually may not. They actually may have to hold. And if they start to see other crazy things happen, then maybe that pulls inflation down. And maybe that means that rates start to come down too because there's obviously a recession in real estate. I hope so. I, I definitely hope the rates come down. <laughs> and yeah. I think a lot of people share your sentiment. Like, you know, they raised rates and they had to to fight inflation and, and we get that. But now this is this literally probably wouldn't have happened because those treasury bonds wouldn't yeah. have lost so much value. They lost so much value because the rates were increased at such a rapid pace. And so that's that's what happens. Those are the unforeseen consequences and circumstances of high interest rates what comes up eventually comes down so we'll see what happens but a lot of economists are predicting that rates over the next year may not rise very much and maybe within a year or so we start to really see them come down it'll be interesting to see what happens to mortgage rates uh, it is kind of that uh, spring season in this country, and it's very important for the real estate market, and, and there's so many markets connected to that. And so we'll see. We'll see. Uh, the, if you're a betting person, I think you'd have to say the odds are that the probably rates should start to maybe settle and come down a little bit slowly, at least in the near term, depending on what the inflation uh, numbers continue to show. And if banks and other uncertainties happen and we start to see more job losses. If those numbers catch up, then we'll for sure see rates start to come down. Yeah, and I, th I think that's kind of inevitable just with what's going on. I, th I think you are going to see, even from, from this situation, you're going to see a lot of these businesses still did have massive impact. They are going to shut down. I mean, we just saw that not Facebook Meta, is that good old they, Meta. They laid that go Facebook. what ten thousand people. Another they just another announced 10. today. Like yeah. it's. I, I think it's inevitable it's happening, and that's kind of the sad truth of this is what had to happen for these rates to come back down. But if, if they don't slow it down, we're already seeing a, a, a giant list of banks that are right there on the brink. And if, if these rates don't calm down, then that's when the full-fledged financial crisis occurs. And, and you know there has to be a number of other banks that we don't know about that were invested in some form of treasury bond, maybe not a 10-year, but maybe a 5-year or a 3-year that they bought that's now – worth a whole lot less and if they get in a cash crunch or if people take money out or they spend money and their bank deposits go down as a bank then they're gonna be in some cash issues just no question about it so we'll see what the government uh, does with that but at the end of the day you know there's there's crazy shit that will always be happening. There are storms and, up and ups and downs that will always be happening. And so what we want to do as business owners, as leaders in our communities, we want to step back and focus on controlling the things that we can control. When we face the adversity, finding those solutions, unreasonable optimism, don't focus in on all the negatives. You have to be aware of them. We're certainly not going to just say positive words and they're going to disappear, but we're going to focus on, well, I can't control that, but here's what I can't control. I can control focusing on sales. I can focus on the values and principles that our team and our culture are built upon. I can serve my clients at a higher level, our strategic partners. I can create better solutions. I can create technology. Technology is still the number one value that you can in put into your company is having some of your own proprietary technology that makes your business worth a lot more when you sell it. I know that, uh, you know, we've got uh, different contacts with our, in our industry and they don't seem to understand that their business is not going to be near as valuable if they don't have some, you know, proprietary technology um, with that business to sell. So if you're looking to create a valuable business, there are certain things you must invest in. Technology is one, a team is another a great experience for your client is, you know, non-negotiable, but focus on the things that you can control. Absolutely. Technology, we've seen, Leo, just in our own business, we've gone from a small little 
working in your your home with three or four of us and uh, we've we've fully scaled to 30 plus employees and we're just I still feel like we're just scratching the surface but like you said it came down to technology the right CRMs the right automations the right yeah. feedback getting the feedback from your clients understanding seeing things from their perspective which I think right now with everything going on is more important than ever we we've got to resonate with our clients and understand that things are hard things are scary right now but as optimistic as we can be, we also need to kind of resonate and see things from, from their view, but, um, awesome. I I feel like I didn't contribute as much this time. This was, this was your show. You're the, you're the expert with this stuff. So I appreciate you taking the time and teaching us here. I think maybe next episode it's, it's time for, uh, I miss the NFL. I, oh, I we, miss there's it so been bad. a lot of st- yeah. We're saying. gonna have an we NFL need to, we need segment. To get everyone yes. caught up. Yes, you're right. There's a lot of movement going on in the yeah. NFL. We're off season. We're favorites. gonna talk about that on Thursday for sure. Yeah, the demise of the Bills and the rays of the Dolphins. Right. Oh my, it's crazy things happen. going on. Quarterbacks moving all over the place. <laughs> so, she's yeah, yeah. What, what, it is what, fun we'll stuff. talk about it on Thursday, guys. We'll see you Thursday, same time, same place. Have an awesome week. Take action, and we'll see you guys on Thursday.